الرحمن الرحيم بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على أشرف المرسلين محمد بن عبد الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي اللهم اجعل تجمعنا هذا تجمعا مرحوما وتفرقنا من بعده تفرقا معصوما ولا تجعل فينا ولا بيننا شقيا ولا محروما إنك ولي ذلك والقادر عليه اللهم نسألك كلمة الحق والعدل في الغضب والرضا اللهم آمين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما uh, The topic of tonight is really a topic that is important to every Muslim on the face of the earth because the topic is concerning our Prophet Muhammad وسلم, and the recent events that have taken place in France and the attempts to defame the reputation of the Prophet ﷺ, to blasphemize him, to assassinate his character. And we will touch a little bit about what is the ruling of the Sharia, what is incumbent upon us as Muslims to take as a course of action, uh, what is the Sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he has placed on earth, and other relevant matters regarding this particular subject. First we start by affirming our aqeedah when it comes to believing in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and glorifying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and raising them, above, raising them above all and loving them more than we love anyone and anything in this world including ourselves, our families and our children. So this is an integral part of us declaring La ilaha illallah Muhammadun Rasulullah and without this part our La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah is deficient and may not be acceptable because we have from the history of Islam, from the Quran and from the Sunnah and from the actions of the Sahaba, the companions of the Prophet when Umar for example came to the Prophet and he said, O oh, Prophet of Allah, I love you more than I love anyone else except myself. The Prophet did not accept that from him. Then he said, I love you more than I love anyone else Anything else, including myself, he said, now. Now your Iman is complete. Now your Tawheed is acceptable. So we see that from the Quran and from the Sunnah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran commands us to honor the Prophet to glorify him, to give him the due reverence that is deserved by him, and so on and so forth, and to follow him. And he says, Meaning that when it comes to tending to our own affairs, the Prophet ﷺ has a higher priority. He has the saying of what's good for us and what's not good for us. What is permissible for us to do and what's not permissible for us to do. This is from declaring Muhammad Rasulullah means none rightfully followed but the Prophet ﷺ. So we can see from a Quran and a Sunnah perspective that is incumbent upon us to honor, to glorify, to love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa more than we honor, love or glorify anyone or anything in, anything in this world. Having said that, we saw throughout the history of mankind that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa had many enemies. And not only him, but other prophets and messengers, peace be unto them all. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says so in the Quran, that it's a sunnah, it's a rule, that he has a way of life that he has placed on earth. And thus we have made enemies. Enemies. We have decreed that there be enemies for the prophets and the messengers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes them by what? Shayateen al insi wal jinn. That they're worse than infidels, they're worse than kuffar. They're actually Satans, they're devil, devils. The word shaitan means Satan, a devil. Shayateen al insi wal jinn is that from people and from the world of jinn as well, because the Prophet ﷺ had enemies from people and also from the world of jinn. That they conspire to you know assassinate the Prophet ﷺ, to harm him, to harm Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to defame his reputation, to you know to, to assassinate his character in so many different ways. So we'll see what the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ has been dealing with them, and with the Sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala dealing with them. Something to keep in mind, at the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa he was not only the messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but he was also the chief in command. It means that he was the head of the Muslim state. 
So in other words, actions he has taken, he has taken with a level of authority as a leader for the Muslim Ummah. Okay? So one cannot say, I'm going to do exactly what the Prophet has done because I'm not the chief in command. I'm just an individual. I'm part of this Ummah. So in other words, I have no authority to do what the Prophet has done. So how did the Prophet deal with his enemies? So many different ways. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sets his ruling in the Quran. And he says, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يُحَادُّونَ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ كُبِتُوا كَمَا كُبِتَ الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِهِمْ That those who take Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his prophet as enemies, they shall be disgraced in this dunya and they shall receive and sustain a severe punishment in the hereafter. And many other places where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّ شَانِئَكَ هُوَ الْأَبْتَرِ Those who take you as an enemy, they are the ones who are going to be severed from the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And those who try to make a name for themselves and prop up their status at the expense of defaming and blasphemizing uh, the number one man, that is our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that those shall also be disgraced in this dunya. It means that opposite result to their objective will take place. They want to raise themselves up high by attacking the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts them even lower. And we've seen that. And we shall narrate, inshallah, some of these stories and events that have taken place. And then, in another ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّا كَفَيْنَاكَ الْمُسْتَهْزِئِينَ We shall protect you and prevent you from those who try to ridicule you and those who try to make mockery of you. And we also see that at the time of the Prophet ﷺ, thereafter, and the days that we live and witness now. So, in the days of the Prophet ﷺ, the first one, who attacked the reputation of the Prophet ﷺ was a man from Bani Najjar. And this man was a scriber. So he used to scribe for the Prophet ﷺ, and as we know, the Prophet did not know how to read or write. So he saw a few of the enemies from among the Israelites of the Prophet ﷺ, so they knew who this man was. So they went to him, and they welcomed him, and they honored him for what he had done. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent a catastrophe upon him. And the man died. So these people were saddened over him because he's the one who was you know, attacking what they perceived to be their enemy, the Prophet ﷺ. So they dug up a grave for him and they buried him. The next day, they came and his body is above the surface of the earth. So they said, this is the making of Muhammad and his companions. So they dug up a deeper grave for him. They buried him only to find the next day that the earth has spit him out again. And he's on the surface of the earth. They made the same statement. This is the work, uh, this, these are the deeds of Muhammad وسلم, and his companions. The th very next day, they came back to find the same body on the surface of the earth. They said, this is not the work of Muhammad وسلم, and his companions. In other words, it was very clear to them that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded the earth to spit him out. Even the earth was disgusted of this, the body of this man. So later, of course, they couldn't help but to observe stray dogs coming to urinate over his head. And this is an act of disgrace. And this is exactly what the Quran says, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shall disgrace them in this world, and in the hereafter they shall receive a severe punishment. We also see that Abi Lahab, Abu Lahab, the one that's mentioned in the Quran, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, تَبَّتْ يَدَىٰ أَبِي لَهَبٍ وَتَبْ مَا أَغْنَىٰ عَنْهُ مَا لَهُ وَمَا كَسَبْ سَيَصْلَىٰ نَارًا ذَاتَ لَهَبْ وَامْرَأَتُهُ وَحَمَّالَةَ الْحَطَبْ فِي جِيدِهَا حَبْنٌ مِّنْ مَسَدْ Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has decreed that this man is an infidel, shall live and die as an infidel, and in the hereafter shall sustain an extremely severe punishment, more specifically for him and for his wife. His son Utba, he vowed to go and cause harm to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in front of the Prophet so he went and he blasphemized Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the presence of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa made one supplication against him. He said, Allahumma sallit alayhi kalban min kilabik. He said, oh Allah, send after him a dog from your dogs. So he came to report to his father, Abu Lahab. So Abu Lahab asked him, he said, what did the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa do? He said, he said, oh Allah, send a dog from your dogs after him, after Utbah. So they were traveling. His father was very concerned. He knows the supplication of the Prophet ﷺ shall come to take place. So when they wanted to rest, they, you know, Abu Lahab told the people who were around him, he said, you know, I fear for the safety of my child 
haven't heard the supplication of Muhammad So gather all of your luggage and make sure he sleeps on top of it and make sure that everybody makes a circle around the luggage and around him as protection. So they did. But of course, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decrees the thing, you know, it's like, where are you going to go? You know, there is no escape, right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent a lion after him. And this lion was an ayah. He came and he smelled every head of these travelers and left them alone. And then he leaped over the luggage and smelled the head of Utbah, the son of Abu Lahab, and he crushed it. He killed him. So his father was certain that something was going to happen to his son. So this is the sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So in the first incident with this man who was scribing for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa was writing down the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent you know, a, a catastrophe over him. In the second incident, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent a lion over him. In the third incident, Ka'b ibn al-Ashraf, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa himself sent a man to assassinate him. He said, لَقَدْ آذَ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ this man has harmed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not physically, but harmed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the sense that he disobeyed him and he blasphemized him. In other words, he angered Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he angered his Prophet sallallahu who is the messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the Prophet sallallahu sent a man after him and this man assassinated him. In another incident where Abu Jahl, we all know who Abu Jahl is, the father of ignorance and, you know, name that describes really the attitude and the behavior of Abu Jahl. He's an ignorant man, extremely arrogant, extremely ignorant. He vowed that if he is to see the Prophet ﷺ prostrating himself in front of the Kaaba, that he's going to step over his head. He's going to step over his head and he's going to throw dust in his face. So when the time came where the Prophet ﷺ was praying in front of the Kaaba, Someone went and told Abu Jahl, come and fulfill your vow. The Prophet is making his salah in front of the Kaaba. So he hastily, you know, he hastened towards, you know, the Prophet Sallallahu in order to live up to his commitment. When he approached there, he was going towards him and then coming back, going towards him and then coming back. So the disbelievers asked him, he said, what happened? You wanted to, you know, fulfill your vow. He said, inni ara. He said, I see a trench out of which fire comes. And wars, you know, in other words, colors of punishment will overtake me if I was to take one step. And wings. So he could not even come close to the Prophet. So when he left and the Prophet was finished with this salah, the believers asked him, O oh, Prophet of Allah, what happened? He said, By Allah, had he had taken one more step, the angels would have taken him apart, one limb at a time, one limb at a time. So here's a man who vowed to, you know, to, to step on the head of the Prophet ﷺ, on his neck, and the Prophet ﷺ was in front of him, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as promised, he, you know, protected him. Another incident, and sometimes these enemies turn into friends, like Abu Sufyan, for example. He's the one who used to speak ill of the Prophet ﷺ, called him a poet called him a crazy person, called him a schizophrenic person, and all of this nonsense. When the Prophet ﷺ opened Mecca, and he, he said, whoever enters his house, his own house, shall be safe. And whoever enters, enters the house of Abu Sufyan, who was a leader back then, shall be safe. Then Abu Sufyan, when he saw that, he wanted to embrace Islam, and he wanted to go speak to the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ refused to speak to him. So he would follow him from one place to the next, from one place to the next. No one that the Prophet ﷺ refused to speak to him. And then at the end, he vowed. He said, I will stay put here, me and my son, and will not make a move until we die out of hunger and thirst, unless the Prophet ﷺ speaks to us. So imagine a man is cursing the Prophet ﷺ, speaking ill of him, defaming his reputation. Now he's vowing not to make a move unless the Prophet ﷺ speaks to him. When the Prophet ﷺ learned that, you know, mercy overtaken his heart, and he went and he spoke to Abu Sufyan, and Abu Sufyan embraced Islam. So imagine, you know, a vowed enemy now becomes a very close friend, uh, you know, a Muslim, a believer. Similarly, a man who vowed to kill the Prophet and he said to his people, I'm going to go and I'm going to kill him, with his own sword. 
They said, how are you going to do that? They said, I'm going to ask him to see his sword, just to smell it, and then I'm going to take that sword and I'm going to drive it into his body. So he goes, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells his prophet, you know, those who have, you know, basically vowed to kill him or assassinate him. So this man went, you know, to fulfill his, you know, vow and to make good on his threat. So he goes to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and said, let me have your sword. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, what do you want with my sword? He said, I just want to smell it. He said, here, take it. He gave him the sword and then his hands, both of his hands shook and the sword fell down. The Prophet Sallallahu looked at him and he said, Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala put between you and what you wanted to do. But this man did not embrace Islam. He just went back defeated, self-defeat. Another person, as the Prophet Sallallahu lies under a tree resting, he put his sword on top of the tree, on one of the branches. So this man came and he took the sword of the Prophet Sallallahu pointed it at him, and he said, who is going to protect you from me now? The Prophet Sallallahu said, Allah. The sword shook from his hand, his hand shook, the sword fell down, the Prophet ﷺ took it and went over him and pointed the sword towards him. He said, who is going to protect you from me now? He said, no one. He said, idhaf fa anta He said, go, you're free. He said, ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna ka rasulullah. He said, I bear witness that there is none rightfully worship but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that you are the Prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In another incident, and subhanAllah, we cannot really count all of these stories, but I'll conclude with this one. And then I'll touch upon the incident that's taken place, you know, in France. When, you know, a member of the Israelites, you know, wanted to, assass to assassinate the Prophet ﷺ, and they prepared a sheep, and they put poison in it. We know this incident, and we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made the sheep speak. The bones of the sheep spoke and said that, it is poisoned. I am poisoned. Do not eat from me. This is another miracle. This is another way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you know, protected the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa So we can see that the sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shall come to pass. That I quite candidly, I feel sorry for anyone who tries to make an enemy out of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has pledged to protect him and to, you know, to protect him physically. To protect his life. To protect his reputation, to protect him from sarcasm, to sever from his mercy anyone who tries to ridicule or defame the reputation of the Prophet. So there's a full protection here in the past, the present, and in the future, as well as this is the number one man. And oftentimes we see that it is not the weak and those who have you know a low status in the society or any of that that are being you know uh, defamed or being attacked, but rather those who are extremely successful. So the more attacks we see on the Prophet the more it is of a testimony from his enemies that he is the number one man. Even though they deny it. And they act in ways contrary to it. So now let's look at the scenario that has taken place. And this is not the first time that you know, uh, cartoons have been uh, made up to depict the Prophet in a way that is totally inappropriate, totally blasphemous, totally uh, ridiculous, if you will. Now, there are two theories to this. One of them is the theory of conspiracy, and one of them, the assumption that the person who was killed, who was assassinated, did in fact come up with these you know, cartoon characters, if you will. Now, those who are privy to this, of course, they look and they examine and they analyze what has taken place, and they see that this is closer to a conspiracy than it is to a fact or a crime that somebody committed. And I'll give you an example. Every time there is an attempt by any country to recognize Palestine as an independent state, you see that problems begin to take place. We've seen this in the US during the Clinton times, right? The Lewinsky's dress coming out of storage a year later. And coincidentally, when you know the Palestinian leaders met with Bill Clinton, the previous president of the United States, in Camp David, and then the prime minister of so-called Israel, left angrily because he was pressured to recognize and to give authority and to give you know, uh, the, the independence to the state of Palestine, they said, you will see, you will hear about what are we going to do. And just a few days after the prime minister left, we, you know, the, the, the dress comes out of storage. And just a lot of commotion is taking place. And that issue of Palestine becoming an independent state was sweet under the rug. 
So now, in the recent events, France has pledged to vow or to declare Palestine as an independent state, right? So what happens? This issue is orchestrated. And that Muslims, you know, if you watch the video, you'll see that it's clearly orchestrated. You know, you know, an assassination attempt, right, that has been videotaped. And then, of course, those who are completely covered with their garments, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, all this, you know, subhanAllah. So I feel like it just has been staged, you know, you can't help. And of course, those who are experts, you know, in, uh, in videos and recordings and so on and so forth, they, that's their opinion. So I'm not reflecting my opinion, but rather the opinion, conveying the opinion of the experts. So you can see that this has been orchestrated, right? So this is the conspiracy theory, and I do ascribe to this theory to a large extent. The other event, and let's say hypothetically speaking that it is Muslims that have committed this act. Is this right or wrong? We mentioned that at the time of the Prophet ﷺ, he was the chief in command. He was the president, if you will. And he was the messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So by way of his authority and his counsel, okay, he assassinated some. He left some to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to deal with. And he has forgiven some. Not everybody whom the, you know, who uh, basically spoke ill of the Prophet ﷺ, he went and he assassinated him. So he was an authority, he was divinely guided, he was the messenger, he was the chief in command. Now, what can we do, number one, as a Muslim Ummah, and unfortunately we are fragmented Muslim Ummah, to the extent that we see that when you call on the leaders of the Muslim Ummah to take action, what do they do? They deceive everyone, including themselves, and they go walk in the funeral, of the one who's been accused of defaming the reputation of the Prophet ﷺ. So that's a clear, utter ignorance and deception of themselves and the Muslim Ummah at large. So in other words, we're left with no authority to guide us on what to do. So what can we do as an individuals? Number one, this is the collective opinion of the scholars. It's not for anyone to individually attempt to apply what they seem, what, what they understand to be as the Sharia or part of the Sharia. Why? Because in the Sharia itself, and we see that in the Quran, when Satan refused to prostrate himself to Adam, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not need a prosecutor and a judge and a jury, he knows all. But he gave him the opportunity to explain himself. In other words, he gave him the opportunity to stand trial where Satan himself is the judge and the jury. Okay? So he said, What have prevented you from making sujood now that I have commanded you? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he knows what the answer is going to be. But here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is teaching you. He's narrating this for us in the Quran so we can learn, so we can take heed, that we cannot take matters into our own hands and act out of ignorance. Okay? In other words, each and every individual who's been accused of a crime, and this is known to be divinely, you know, uh, legislated, and also by the legislation of mankind that you have the opportunity to stand trial and answer to your crime. And then the due process must take place, must take place and the standard proof must be established, for, be it from a divine law or from a man-made law. In this case, and again, we're just saying supposedly, hypothetically speaking, that those who have taken it upon themselves to kill this person, this Jonas who's been accused of defaming the reputation of the Prophet ﷺ, that they have done so to protect the reputation of the Prophet ﷺ, they have acted out of ignorance. Because along the way, they have not given this man an opportunity to answer for himself. That's one. Number two, they've killed other innocent people that have nothing to do with the whole issue. There are other people who are innocent, who are basically bystanders or worked in the office that have absolutely nothing to do with the issue, they were also killed. And what do we learn about murder in Islam? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, مِنْ أَجْلِ ذَلِكَ كَتَبْنَا عَلَى بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلِ أَنَّهُ مَنْ قَتَلَ نَفْسًا بِغَيْرِ نَفْسٍ أَوْ فَسَادٍ فِي الْأَرْضِ فَكَأَنَّمَا قَتَلَ النَّاسَ جَمِيعًا That one who kills a nafs without just cause, which is mentioned you know, in the Quran and the Sunnah, what the just cause is, and I don't want to go into details, because we all of us ought to know what a just cause is by now. As if he or she has killed the entire humanity. And one who revives one soul, be it saving this soul in the emergency room or on the road or you know, preventing them from you know, destroying themselves, as if they have brought to life the entire humanity. And the sacred blood 
of any individual is of utmost significance to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet ﷺ says in the hadith, لا يزال المسلم في فسحة من ديني ما لم يصد دم الحراما That the gates of tawbah and repentance for a Muslim are wide open, so long that they do not kill a soul unjustly. So long that they do not kill a soul unjustly. So this group, and again, I say hypothetically speaking, you know, hypothetically speaking that this group or these individuals that have killed this journalist are Muslims, because I very much doubt that, that if they've acted, you know, in accordance with the Sharia, they would not have done that. They would have done, they would have used other methods. They would have filed a lawsuit against this person or against this, you know, uh, magazine organization or in this news channel, whatever the case might be. They would have brought them to justice by using all sorts of peaceful means, but not resorting to becoming the judge, the jury, and the prosecutor at the same time, and killing other innocent people also along the way, because in this case, they have replaced a munkar with what? With a greater munkar. And it's from the fiqh and the understanding of our sharia, who have to replace you know, the munkar, that which is prohibited by the sharia, that which is outlawed by the sharia, is that you do not replace it with a greater munkar. So you are trying to replace an accusation with victim. In other words, this is a lesser munkar, this is a, and that one is a greater munkar. There is no dispute among the scholars that one, be it a Muslim or a non-Muslim, that defames or blasphemizes or attacks the character of the Prophet ﷺ, that this person is a kafir, and that this person is subjected to capital punishment. But it's not by the individuals, it's not left up to you and I to go on and execute and act upon that without going through the due process. It's up to the leader of the Muslim Ummah, it's up to the authority of the Muslim Ummah to bring this person into a courtroom, to have them stand trial, to establish the burden proof, and then from there, you know, pass whatever appropriate judgment that needs to be passed. I just thought I'd share this information with us because oftentimes we tend to act out of emotions. In other words, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to act out of the sharia. When we say I'm a Muslim, it means that I surrender, I submit, and I obey. Surrender, submit, and obey to the jurisprudence that is mentioned in the Quran and in the Sunnah. And it's not for me to act out of emotions. Because oftentimes, when we act out of emotions, it means that we are acting out of pure anger. And oftentimes, we're not going to adhere to the sharia, and we're not going to use common sense and use good judgment. So I just wanted to share this you know, with all of us, and I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us among those who listen to the words of wisdom and follow the best of it. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to show us the truth as truth and to grant us the ability to find it and, and follow it and to show us falsehood as falsehood and to grant us the success you know, to find that and follow it. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to continue to teach us the words of wisdom and to continue to guide us to cause us to live in a state of Islam, die in a state of Iman. أقول قولي هذا واستغفر استغفروا سبحانك رب الحمدك نشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت نستغفرك ونتوب إليك سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين جزاكم الله خيرا السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته